Hello, Booktube. Today I'm reviewing a nonfiction book. It's, in bi it's a biography of Stalin by Stephen Kotkin, the first in a planned trilogy. Only two of them are out so far. This one's called Stalin, Paradoxes of Power. And this covers his life of this uh, dictator from 1878 to 1928. So I've noticed about the, uh, the nonfiction books I've read recently, you know, the biography of Napoleon, bi the um, book by Simon Scalman about, called Citizens about the French Revolution, is they're kind of opinionated, and this one actually follows that. Uh, Stephen Kotkin actually deliberately challenges and goes against uh, many old assumptions made about Stalin by historians. <clears throat> I think uh, the first of these is that he challenges the idea that Stalin was just, I mean, obviously he agrees with evil, anyone has to be evil, but he challenges the idea that he was just a cynical sociopath who didn't actually care about the communist ideology. Kotkin argues that, that for um, Stalin, Marxist ideology was very important, even though he could sometimes display a cynical attitude towards it. A lot of his decisions make absolutely no sense unless you see them through the lens of someone who's zealously devoted to communism. For example, his decision to collectivize agriculture, which isn't dealt with in this volume, but the next one, doesn't make any sense unless you see him as being a communist revolutionary, because it was a terrible idea and it led to death of millions, and he, but Stalin's will and desi zealous desire to see communism implemented drove him to do that. He also challenges the idea that Stalin, uh, this is actually probably one of his biggest uh, challenges to orthodoxy, is that Stalin had a bad childhood. He actually disagrees, and I'm not sure if I agree with him here, entirely at least, but he points out, so a lot of people say that um, Stalin's parents beat him brutally, and that contributed to becoming a sociopath, but in this book, he argues that, I mean, his parents sometimes beat him, but probably not more than a lot of other people, a lot of other parents at the time. And other things people associate with his bad childhood, like him being involved in, like, um, rough housing and fighting and stuff, which is common to which is common to small boys anywhere. And basically, his argument then is that Stalin's like real evil didn't manifest itself until, or at least not entirely, until he gained political power and he got in the um, got into factional struggles with the other Bolsheviks. I, the reason I don't, I'm not, I don't really entirely agree with this though, is that there's a lot of stuff Kotkin goes over his life about how in his early days in the Bolsheviks, which does not make him sound like a good person at all, even before that. Like, he committed robbery, extortion, he had numerous affairs, he, actually one of his worst things he did was he, um, he got this 13-year-old, 13-year-old girl pregnant, she had a miscarriage and he left, and then he got pregnant again, and then she had a baby and he left. He had many legitimate children. I don't think Kotkin is, has a good explanation for how Stalin, like, he seems clearly evil even before he got the power, so Kotkin doesn't have a very good explanation for why he um why he like he led why his um <clears throat> morals went that way another thing he also can't explain very well is why he became a communist so he goes over this briefly is that so he starts out as a very religious uh, seminarian like he's trained to become a priest but he meets this other um guy in, in the priesthood named leto and leto introduces him to marxism but it's not explained how he comes to like zealously attached to it like i've heard other explanations being like oh his mother died and that's how he learned that inside oh there's no god or whatever but it's not, there isn't an adequate explanation for that in the book. And this actually lead me into my biggest problem with this book. And I think it's a problem that pretty much encompasses the whole thing. It actually does not read so much like a biography of Stalin. So much it reads like a history of the times he lived in. Like the structure is kind of like this. So talk one chapter about Stalin, like what he's doing. And then another chapter, sometimes more than one chapter, about the larger historical period. Like the history of the Russian Empire, then World War I, then the Russian Revolution, then the Russian Civil War. And they go into great detail about those things. When he returns to Stalin, uh, sometimes the analysis seems kind of shallow, and I've actually left not with a very good appreciation of like his personality. Like in the book Napoleon, Andrew Roberts, you got I think there was pretty good historical analysis like at the larger time, but there was a, a great sense of like giving you an idea of his personality. Like he, like Andrew Roberts went over Napoleon's like uh, how he was really interested in literature and he was very cultured, and how he could be. Oh, he had numerous mistresses, and how his relationship with his wife evolved over time, him, him loving her, and then him being ambivalent, like, it's a whole thing. Like, you could get a clearer sense of who he was as a person. In Stalin Paradox of Power, I have very little idea. Well, not no idea, but I don't have much idea. Like, you could learn that Stalin was an avid reader when he was younger, and that he was uh, largely self-taught, and, of course, that he was a philanderer, like, you know, relations, relations with a numerous women. But that's all you get. Like, I don't understand why he was able to do such evil, but then also apparently be in love with the two wives he did have in this period. I don't really understand why he became a devoted communist. I thought the book, it's too focused, it's actually too focused on context, not focused enough on the person itself. So because of this, it doesn't reveal too much about his personality, 
and why he became the way he did. But to be fair, there's a lot in there that could just be speculation. Like maybe Kotkin wants to keep it as objective as possible, so he doesn't um, risk doing that. Another thing about this book is that this is definitely not for everyone. You know, I, I like, a, you, if you watch my channel for a long time, you probably know I really like obscure words and stuff like that. And I like offers big vocabulary. Kotkin kind of delivers in that. Like not as much as uh, something like Skama, which is like in a league of his own with really obscure words. But every once in a while I'll throw in something. I learned some new words like imbroglio and autodidact, for example. I, I like I like their new words. That's the thing. I wonder how common that actually is. Like I've noticed with a lot of the last two nonfiction books I read, and this one as well, which is the last three, uh, the authors like to use words you wouldn't really normally hear anywhere else. Also, Cockney likes to use a lot of like, Latin phrases like sui generis and uh, beta compli. Um, <clears throat> and I wonder if that's a common... Th I haven't read enough nonfiction, no. I wonder if it's a common thing, maybe in like the more academic kind of historical... I mean, of uh, history books, or maybe it's just um, an old, I mean, popular books. I don't know. I haven't read like a David McCullough, so I don't know like how he writes, for example. Anyway, um, despite my disappointments with how the book provides way too much context at the expense of... Uh, any details, but like really piercing details about his personal life. I still can admire the book because it does have some pretty interesting challenges to a lot of traditional Orthodox at Stalin. It actually, like I know a lot of the Russian Revolution and the historical background. And actually, because of that, I'm not quite sure if I recommend this for a newbie because I've read a lot about the Russian Revolution before. And I actually learned new stuff. Like I actually like had things I thought were true were really challenged. Like for example, there was one dispute between Lenin and Stalin. Actually, oh, one of the biggest things of this book and this guys in that dispute there's this idea that uh, Lenin actually wanted Stalin removed, and he wrote a testament against it. But Kotkin takes the attitude that that testament is actually it's very doubtful that it actually was written by Lenin. It was mo it was actually like there's a not certain, but there was a good chance it was a forgery, especially because Lenin and Stalin had a very close, very intimate relationship before he died. So there's like there's no real good reason for not falling out, and even the things people cite as having contributed to the falling out, like. Uh, Stalin shouting at it, Lenin's wife might have been manufactured. I, I, that was that was the most interesting part of the book for me was learning how the Lenin Stalin feud was actually largely exaggerated, and they had a very close relationship. And Stalin was probably like logically Lenin's successor. Anyway, so I had this point to the book regarding the context, but I learned some interesting things, and I really respect Stephen Cockin for how he challenged a lot of uh, orthodox and things I thought were true. And so I can give this book a four to five stars, but I don't know if I'd recommend it for people who are new to studying the Russian Revolution and the Soviet Union. Uh, I might hold off on that a bit. But anyway, uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, feel free to uh, make sure to uh, like, comment, and subscribe to please the YouTube algorithm gods. And uh, yeah, bye. Thank you for watching.